yeah, I did change, and I'm really glad I changed. This one's wife. American Riviera Orchard. She's been trying and failing for 20 years. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. As you know, this one's wife has launched American Riviera Orchard, which very much does sound like some kind of care or nursing home, but apparently it's not. It's the aspirational home lifestyle brand that this one's wife has created. Created with such vigour that it's not even ready, but she needed to ensure that it was launched to try and overshadow the Prince of Wales with the Diana Legacy Awards. This provides us with another opportunity to understand her narcissism in action. And as part of this, I have utilised an excellent timeline that has been put together by somebody who writes under the name of Some Speculation on the St. This One's Wife's thread. As you know, they use her full name. I do not. Appropriate credit to be given for the compilation of this information, which I'm going to use to demonstrate further aspects of This One's Wife's narcissism. The post explains that back in 2004, this one's wife meets up with coming up meets up and coming producer Trevor Engelson. Within a few months, she's moved in with him. That as itself is a narcissistic indicator, showing a sense of entitlement to quickly assert control over him by living together. She spends roughly a decade working at best as an extra with less than five gigs a year. During this time, she curates, yes, that awful word, a very specific home life for them, hosting dinner parties and buying a white-based aesthetic of home goods. This is reported on. Unable to believe his own good fortune, Trevor told his friends that he had met the hottest chick in California. After a few months, this one's wife moved into his home on Hilldale, West Hollywood. Thrilled by her cat, she proclaimed, I've got my toothbrush in his cabinet. Trevor discovered his beautiful woman was also a domestic goddess. She was definitely a curator of a beautiful life, said Ninaki. It was Ninaki Pretty, her friend. She had a very specific style. She loved her hotel style bedding. Beautiful contrasting black piping detail on crisp white duvets. She loved everything white. This one's wife was a perfectionist. She liked to throw dinner parties with beautiful menus that complemented flavour profiles with amazing wile, wines. Thus, this was reported on all that time ago, 20 years ago. This demonstrates another part of her facade management to make her look like she is a domestic goddess. Whereas, of course, we all know that she's got a freakish eye for detail, which results in her often looking like she's just rolled out of bed. And again, a domestic goddess that wears clothing that doesn't fit? Hmm, okay, well, if you say so. But it demonstrates that even back then, she had developed this idea that she would be creating this white-based aesthetic. Then, we fast forward to 2014, this one's wife, in May of that year, launches the TIG to promote fashion, beauty, travel, food, a lifestyle. And there's an instance of one of the posts that she put out, which the, the commentator has highlighted from an archive post, Welcome to the TIG, where this one's wife wrote, the 5th of May conjures up vivid musings for me. I closed my eyes and pictured parties for Cinco de Mayo, cucumber-laden margaritas and tacos in hand, a piñata bursting at the seams with tamarind candies and ring pops. I see the Kentucky Derby, a deep-rooted tradition I have long wanted to take part in, which falls on the same weekend. I see myself wearing a massive hat, ceremoniously so, sipping a mint julep and tumbling into the southern revelry of it all. I do have a soft spot for the pomp and circumstance, if I'm being honest. But then a dear friend, Avery Plews, former costume buyer on suits and fashion, maven extraordinaire, 
pointed out that May the 5th also marks the day that Coco Chanel introduced her iconic fragrance, Chanel No. 5. With a little research, it turns out that the 5th of May was also the day Mrs. Chanel presented her dress collections. She had quite an affinity for the number 5, feeling it would bring good luck. So, in the interest of taking good luck wherever I can find it, today marks the launch of the TIG. Cheers to frolicking and revelry, to badass ladies and gents who inspire change, to finding the beauty in the unexpected, to sharing ideas, supporting the silliness, eating delicious food, living a life of wanderlust and taking it all in, with class, unrelenting splendour and a sense of humour. Cheers to an inspired lifestyle. Welcome to the world, Tig. Don't worry, everyone will be nice. They know you're just getting started an early attempt there to influence people with regard to their comments about her new endeavour. And thus, she creates the TIG. And if you want to be royally entertained, listen to my parodies, The Stig. From 2014 to 2015, she's seen Toronto psychic Richard Wynne. He, she then recommends him to her makeup artist, he thanks her for introducing them on his Instagram. In revenge, Tom Bauer confirms, while dating Corey Vitiello, the celebrity chef, this one's wife was looking to leverage it into her own cooking show. This was confirmed by her psychic, Richard Wynne. While speaking with In Touch Weekly, former psychic Richard Wynne revealed that this one's wife planned to buy a wedding dress while dating Corey Vitiello. The psychic said that this one's wife wanted to marry her ex-boyfriend and their discussions were mostly centred on their relationship. I mean, she really was in love with Corey. She told me his mother and his sister were like family to her. When she was coming to me, she was on suits, but then she came to me. But when she came to me, she really wanted to do a cooking programme with Corey. She was really planning on settling down with Corey, Wynne said. Even though this one's wife was serious about wanting to marry Vitiello, Wynne said that he already knew that the two wouldn't end up together. The psychic reportedly telling this one's wife that she would end up in London, and this is exactly what happened, which it's, isn't that interesting that with the benefit of hindsight, the psychic is able to tell her what she was going to happen. Thus already we have this white aesthetic, the domestic goddess, the creation of dinner parties, the stig, and now she wants to have her own cookery program. In 2014, there's a soft audition for a cooking show hosted by Hayley Duff, Hilary Duff's sister. She clearly doesn't have much in the way of celebrity status because at that time she had to share screen time with a celebrity's significantly less famous sibling. Between 2014 and 2016, whilst dating Corey, the TIG started to focus more on food and wine and travel. 2015, Corey opens Flock, his restaurant featuring a signature roasted chicken. October the 31st, 2016, this one's wife describes roasted chicken as the dish she entertains with and brings to parties. The article also describes her in the subtitle as Whip Smart. Hmm, I think we've heard that a few times. November the 1st, 2016, this one's wife is publicly confirmed as Harry's girlfriend via People magazine. A friend indicates it's pretty serious and they could be engaged soon. 27th of November 2016, this one's wife and Harry do an engagement interview with the BBC, claiming they were at home roasting a chicken when Harry proposed. Yet, Finding Freedom indicates they were already engaged by August. June, the, 20, June 2019... Sussex Royal trademarked for a variety of goods and services, while still a working royal, six months before Megxit was announced. What did it include? Bucks, homewares, clothing. The Sussex Royal Instagram and web page were set up only months earlier. 29th of August 2022, this one's wife teased a secret to interviewer Alison P. Davis from the Court that she's returning to Instagram. As the interview wraps up, she gifts her some goods, including jam. The interview is published two days before the anniversary of Diana's death. This one's wife mimics Diana's picture on the cover. January the 29th, 2024, according to the Delaware Secretary of State, the trademark applicant, Mama Knows Best LLC, was incorporated on January the 19th, 2024. That was two days after Kensington Palace announced that Catherine had undergone major surgery. 
March 15, 2024, this one's wife publicly announces American Riviera Orchard. At the time of the announcement, there are no products listed on the website, and the trademark for goods like ketchup, jam, cookbooks, homewares, clothing is still pending. There's also mention of a cooking show for Netflix, but Netflix doesn't comment or confirm. This press release, of course, was timed within an hour to attempt to overshadow William speaking at the Diana Awards. Thus, what have we got? For nigh on 20 years, she has been attempting to get off the ground her lifestyle brand. Obsessed with the white aesthetic, talking about cooking, talking about food and wine, homeware, there's been repeated instances of her attempting to get this off the ground. But she never has done. For 20 years, she has sought to portray herself as the domestic goddess and get this lifestyle brand up and running. And she hasn't been able to do so. Notwithstanding the links that she had with Corey, notwithstanding the attempts that were made by appearing on television, appearing on a cooking show, of her attempts to embrace the various scenes in Toronto, she failed. For 20 years, repeatedly, she's looked at trying to launch this lifestyle brand. You might say that she's something that she's always been focused on. This is demonstrative of the way that her narcissism works. It tells her that she is talented and that she is brilliant and she believes it. It tells her that she can create these lifestyle brands, that she's got something to offer, that she is interesting and fresh and new. And yet here we are 20 years later and she's still not done it. Indeed, she's been part of the royal family. She had global popularity and still hasn't been able to get anywhere with it. As the commenter points out, she's promoted three separate brands in a month. There was Archwell, which we saw with the South by Southwest sponsorship and her appearance there. Then we had Sussex.com, which doesn't appear to have gone anywhere. And then American Riviera Orchard. She doesn't seem to know what she wants to be. She doesn't seem to know what she's actually putting forward. Three separate brands. Thus, Archwell might be seen perhaps as a charitable philanthropic arm, but what's Sussex.com doing? Is that just the PR arm? And then American Riviera Orchard is the lifestyle brand. It all seems rather messy and uncoordinated. But the point is this. You can see how she's repeatedly attempted through this information that has been pulled together as a timeline of previous failures by some speculation that this one's wife has repeatedly sought to get a lifestyle brand up and running, that she's had repeated dalliances with it, but has failed. Why? Well, part of this is down to the fact that her narcissism creates this sense of entitlement, whereby she thinks that it should just come into being overnight and she'll be immediately successful. And when it's not, she loses interest. Because she has no sense of accountability to work at something, she believes, and we've seen her do this time and time again with this concept of manifesting, that if she just talks about it or thinks about it, she thinks it'll come into being. She doesn't realise that all of these success stories that one reads about, that might appear overnight with 10 years in the making, that these people have brought together talent with hard work, that they've built up followings, that they have pressed flesh and made the connections, that they have created partnerships, and that they've done the less desirable and less glamorous stuff. For instance, take comedians that you think, gosh, they're everywhere. They may well have spent 10, 15, 20 years doing the circuit, getting heckled in clubs, performing for not very much money, taking bit parts here and there, and then all of a sudden, they're noticed and it pays off and they start to get a more prominent position on a television show, and then they have their own tour, etc. And it seems to you that they're like an overnight sensation, but they're not. They've honed their craft. They've spent years 
working out which are the best jokes. They've fallen flat on their faces in numerous cases. They've died on stage. But they've taken all of that in their stride, and they have a natural talent for comedy and timing and writing that comedy, and they've worked hard at it, so they achieve their success. But this one's wife doesn't understand that. She thinks it should just come to her automatically. And so what happens with this lifestyle brand is she starts to do things in relation to it, thinking it should take off, and then it doesn't. So she drifts away onto something else and then comes back to it. And then it doesn't work again, and she drifts away elsewhere because she has no accountability. One of the hallmarks of a narcissist is their inability to finish things, their inability to see things through to a conclusion. It doesn't apply to every single narcissist, but many do. They're caught up in the excitement. And remember, if they can talk about something to achieve the prime aims, and that does that, there's no need thereafter to follow it up with actual action. This one's wife wants that lifestyle brand. She believes it's what she's all about. And she's been plugging away at this on and off for the last 20 years. But she's failed. And American Riviera Orchard is just an amalgam of everything that she's done before. This white aesthetic, the homeware, the TIG. There's nothing new about it. All she's doing is recycling something that she's wanted to achieve for 20 years, but has failed to do so. It doesn't all go well. It doesn't suggest that she has the talent, the ability or the likability to make American Riviera Orchard work. But this timeline of failures is demonstrative of how her narcissism functions. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.